uh, Mike Pence, uh, the presumptive vice presidential nominee, speaking at a restaurant Man. right now. Uh, I want to listen in briefly. My fellow conservatives, it is very humbling for me as a small town boy from southern Indiana whose grandfather came to this great country in 1923 to think that I will step to a podium and accept my party's nomination to run and serve as the next Vice President of the United States of America. I'm honored to be with you today. Uh, honored to be able to come by and thank you. And thank Matt and thank the American Conservative Union for everything you've done for the cause in the country throughout my 57 years. Uh, I'm joined today by the highest ranking official in the state of Indiana, the future second lady of the United States of America, Karen Pence, is with us, with our daughter, Charlotte. I'm so grateful for Chris's introduction, for his great leadership at the NRA. But for all those kind words, I prefer a shorter introduction. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. My own journey, maybe like yours, has been an interesting one in public life. I actually started out in the other party when I was a young person. Became active in, I was the uh, Democratic Party Youth Coordinator in Bartholomew County, Indiana. Kind of a community organizer, if you will. But it was after I heard the voice and the ideals of our 40th president that I knew, that I knew, that I knew in my heart that my place was in the Republican Party. Started our family, married the girl of my dreams, and started running for office. Like Newt Gingrich, it took me three times to get elected to Washington, D.C. But we made it. But it's been a fascinating journey that many of you in the room were a part of and continue to be a part of. A journey that began with a Time for Choosing speech in 1964 and the candidacy of Barry Goldwater would culminate in the great election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 and in Newt Gingrich's Republican revolution that took over the Congress after decades of Democrat control. But I actually, I, I ran for Congress uh, first before the Republican Revolution, but frankly, sometimes I felt like I got elected after it was over. By the time I arrived in Washington, D.C., the first priority of a Republican president was no child left behind, one of the largest expansions of the federal government's role in education in the history of the department. And soon I found myself battling against uh, a president and leaders in my own party on that issue, on the expansion of entitlements. And I'm, I'm proud to say I was one of the first to fight against the Wall Street bailout on Capitol Hill. I watched as our party lost their way and, in, not surprisingly, lost the majority in 2006. But then I had the great privilege of being a part of a renewed Republican conference. And I was part of the leadership team that retired Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House in 2010. In 2012, it was back home again to Indiana. I had the opportunity to step in as governor of the great state of Indiana. I followed on the heels of a great friend and champion of conservative ideals and a great, great leader in our state, Mitch Daniels. He'd put our fiscal house in order, but I, I knew that if we, if, we, if we allowed the people of Indiana to keep more of what they earned, if we made the right investments in education, innovation, and reform, if we made the right investments in the kind of government that Hoosiers might expect, that we could go from good to great. And we did. In the last four years, we passed the largest state tax cut in Indiana history and now are home to the largest school voucher program in the United States of America. <laughs> Unemployment 
Unemployment in Indiana was over 8% when I became governor, and it's below 5% today. Hoosier businesses, large and small, have created more than 150,000 net new jobs. And here in our bicentennial year in my state, we have more Hoosiers going to work than ever before in the 200-year history of the state of Indiana. But that's what strong Republican leadership gets you. And that's exactly the kind of strong Republican leadership that Donald Trump will bring to the White House. Trust me when I say this. When we come together as a party and a people, we re-elect strong conservative majorities in the House and the Senate, and elect this good man as the 45th President of the United States, I know in my heart of hearts we will make America great again at home and abroad. He's a builder, fighter. He's a father and he's a patriot. I have to tell you, having had some time to spend with this good man and his family, I know that Donald Trump will be a great President of the United States of America because his heart beats with the heart of the American people. I honestly believe, I honestly believe in the collective wisdom of the American people and the capacity of the people of our nation to know who we need, who the right person is at the right time for America. It happened in 1980, when Ronald Reagan was chosen, that we had a man, like our nominee this year, who, although he had achieved great heights in his own career, never lost touch with everyday Americans. To be around our nominee, as I had the privilege to be, not on the campaign trail, but out among his associates, people that he's employed for years, and among his family. I have a sense of this man. I have a sense of his heart. I have a sense of his hands-on style of leadership. And for all the world, he reminds me of Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan achieved great things in his life and his career. A, a movie star, a celebrity, a governor of the great state of California. But he never lost the common touch, did he? One of my most uh, cherished speeches of Ronald Reagan was his farewell address in the Oval Office. In fact, he talked about being in a motorcade. And I can report to you today here at the ACU, I came over on my first trip in a motorcade today. <laughs> I actually got out of the car in the alley and I saw all these cars. <laughs> And I turned to the security official and I said, are they all with us? <laughs> so welcome to our world, dear. <laughs> but I'll never forget those words, and I'll paraphrase them if you'll forgive me. In the Oval Office, when Ronald Reagan talked about speeding by and seeing everyday Americans waving and how in his heart of heart, even after eight years that literally transformed our nation and transformed the world, Ronald Reagan spoke about how he wanted just to reach out and touch the people that were waving along the roadsides because that's where his heart was at. And I submit to you today, having gotten to know this good man who is our nominee, Donald Trump may have achieved great heights in business and in industry and in the world of entertainment, but his heart is with everyday Americans, and he will fight every day to strengthen this nation and bring America back. So the time has come for us to come together. Primaries are over. It was a big stage up there with a lot of extraordinarily talented men and women. But I say to my fellow conservatives today, it's time for us to come together. Time for us to come together around this good man and re-electing Republican majorities in the House and the Senate because this is no ordinary time in the life of our nation.
The truth of the matter is the agenda of Barack Obama and Hillary place in the world and stifled our nation's economy. And so we must decide here and now that Hillary Clinton will never become president of the United States of America. For the sake of our troops, who deserve a commander-in-chief who will have their back. For the sake of hard-working Americans and businesses who deserve a president who will get Washington, D.C. off their back. And for the sake of a Supreme Court that will uphold the sanctity of life, our Second Amendment, and our God given liberties, we must elect Donald Trump as the 45th President of the United States of America. And we must be confident. With this, I'll close. We must be confident in the choice the American people will make and have made. I got a chance to meet Ronald Reagan in 1988 when I was preparing to lose my first campaign for Congress. <laughs> we went to the White House. You can probably Google it online and find a picture of someone who looks alarmingly like my son sitting next to Ronald Reagan. <laughs> we were waiting anxiously. Karen and I were in the East Room with a, a short line of candidates waiting for the photo op with the president. They'd handed me a card about what to say, something about we needed a bridge or we needed a road or something about Indiana that we could put in a press release. And I turned to that young lady over there and I said, you know, this is, man is the reason why I became a Republican. And I just would like to say something from my heart. And my wife, as she always does, says, just tell them what's on your heart. So I sat down. It's in the blue room. I sat down across from the president. For all the world, I felt like I was talking to Mount Rushmore. <laughs> I was a little nervous. But I collected myself and... Uh, the president graciously asked as the cameras were clicking, he said, he said, Mike, how's, how's the campaign going? And I said, uh, well, it's going fine, but I got something I'd like to say. And he said, well, say it. And I said, uh, Mr. President, uh, I would just like to thank you for everything you've done for this country and everything you've done to encourage my generation of Americans to believe in this country again. And for all the world, for the rest of my life, I will believe in that moment that the 40th President of the United States of America blushed <laughs> and said, well, that's a very nice thing of you to say. like he'd never heard it before. <laughs> but then a few minutes later, I understood... Mike Pence, uh, the presumptive Republican vice presidential nominee, speaking at the American Conservative Union here in Ohio, making the case for Donald Trump. Uh, you know, Sam, we're talking to Sam Clovis from the Trump campaign, national campaign co-chairman. Uh, it was interesting. He's going to be officially nominated tomorrow night. There will be speeches uh, mentioning him, videos. Yeah. And last night we barely heard his name mentioned. Uh, did you notice that? Well, I didn't notice that. I, I was I was pretty, uh, I really got off to a ro you know, roaring start there. I will tell you, um, uh, it was very emotional early on. Uh, and I think that uh, the speech that Marcus Luttrell gave, and it's because I know Marcus, and I think that's probably one of the reasons that it, would, it affected me so, and it set the tone for me for the rest of the night. I was really anticipating uh, a, a really a gangbusters evening. I was not disappointed. I thought that Rudy blew the doors off of the place. And, uh, and I, I felt that Dave Clark, Sheriff Dave Clark, was just spectacular 
in his articulation of the, the case he made. And then finally, Melania. And, and not to diminish any of the other uh, speakers, you know, my good friends were up on that stage last night, too, and Joni Ernst and, and others. But I, it was just fantastic evening for me. But Marcus was the one that really got me started. Yeah, there were a lot of just set the tone for everything. There were a lot of powerful speeches up there, and I'm sure from your perspective, it's a pity that all of a sudden the whole plagiarism issue uh, is sort of hovering over there. You really miss the substance, and and you miss the 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 spectacular elegance and eloquence of of Melania, and I and I think that really is a detraction detraction on this whole issue, and and it's unfortunate, but it is politics, and we understand that. Sam Clevis, thanks very much.